Welcome. This is workshop four at the Michigan Works Conference, Applying Lean Principles to Any Process. If everyone can for a moment just take your cell phone out and silence it, we'd really appreciate it. And then also, after the conference is over, there's an online survey if you wouldn't mind taking it just to let us know about your experience at the conference and your experience with this workshop, we'd also appreciate that. So our speaker today, I'll hand it over right away. Rob Stauffer will give us everything he has to know about the lean process. So welcome, Rob. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Um, out of all the conferences, you could have picked, you picked this one. We like that. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Rob Stauffer. I work for a company called the MMTC. It says it up here. Michigan Manufacturing Technology Center. Briefly, who are we? What are we about? Um, some companies have really fancy mission statements. Ours is simple. If you're a Michigan company, we want to help you get better at whatever it is that you do. Um, ultimately, we are measured. Um, we receive some federal funding. We are also partners with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Um, as with most federal programs, we have to earn our keep. We work with companies that come back and ask, well, what happened? Did you do anything interesting with that funding? Um, so honestly, we're here. Uh, we're glad that you're here to learn about learn, uh, to learn about lean principles. How many people are doing some of this stuff already? You've been to class. You've heard about it before. You're doing some couple of hands. That's, that's cool. So today what we want to do, how many people have heard of lean before at all? Cool. How many people love the word lean? <laughs> love is a strong word. It's kind of got, got a reputation, if you will. I wish we could just add a car right there and call it earn. Because that's what we want you to do today. We want you to think, how does this apply to what I do? When I have to go back to the ranch and do whatever, in whatever capacity you work, how does this relate when you go back tomorrow? Um, not how does it not work for us, because we understand most people in the room don't make stuff. That's okay. Don't let the manufacturing throw you off. Um, but today we want to learn as much as we can about lean principles. We'll show you a little bit of a video to kind of drive it home. Most people can relate to it. Um, so, wow. That, that's a wordy slide. So my first promise is that's the wordiest slide we're going to show you today because that violates all kinds of presentation rules. But we want to give you the Reader's Digest version of what is this. When somebody comes back and says, hey, you went to that 90 minutes, what was it about? You can open this one pager and say, you know, this is what we talked about. Um, so I'd like to ask, even though it's 90 minutes, you're probably going to get sick of hearing my voice. So would anybody like to volunteer to read a paragraph out loud for me? Great. Thank you. A lean system is an organ, organization whose product and service <clears throat> delivery process are waste-free. The people in a lean system think, act, and manage differently than people in any other organization. They understand and apply lean tools and analysis methods towards eliminating waste and non-value added work on a daily basis. Thank you. I'll just highlight a couple things and I won't read it to you again. Um, we, we care about waste. How many people have waste back in their process? Whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you work. <laughs> Cool. We're going to spend some time defining it, because when other people don't see it, they just don't see it. And it just starts to look normal. So we're going to get some education today. What is waste? What is it not? What are we talking about when we talk about the eight types of waste? The other thing is, says we're asking you to think differently. Does that scare you a little bit? Most adults, you're not getting in my head that easy. But we want you to just kind of step back again and say, how does this relate to what I do? Um, we do this on a daily basis. A lot of people get this, this weird idea. Lean means going to class for a week and getting a cool certificate and putting it on the wall. And it looks really nice and can frame it. Or they say, well, it's, it's an event. We're going to take a week and we're going to fix a process. Well, it is a series of events. Um, it's sort of like a never-ending process. We do it every day. It's not a, a lot of people get, I don't know where the notion is that it's an event. Events are cool, but we like multiple events. We do it every day. Another volunteer. Pretty pleased. To, to read. Dan, thank you. Lean systems were pioneered by Henry Ford beginning in 1908 and later perfected by Toyota beginning in the 1950s. The goal of the lean system is the uninterrupted flow of products, services, and information. Achieving flow requires perfecting the performance of all its processes and using its resources more effectively than organizations who do not yet understand lean. Thanks, Dan. How many people have a limitless war chest of money to go solve problems right now? Right? I think the, the, the tune of the day is budget cuts, we have the resources we have, and we still have to get the work done. Um, so we'll, we'll highlight some of the things out of here. We'll talk about flow a little bit later. Probably the most interesting thing is that 1908. That's, this stuff isn't new. 
been around a long time. Henry Ford figured out a long time ago the longer it takes to do something, it costs more. Anybody disagree with that? I don't care what your process is, I don't care if you're a service company or if you make stuff or you're a hospital or a bank. The longer it takes to do stuff, it costs more. Right? That's a very common sense thing. You might leave here saying, that guy had a whole bunch of common sense, but it's just not very common practice. That's why we work in almost every industry you can think of. Um, Toyota's had their issues. They've been doing this a long time. Uh, we, don't, we know people don't get excited about the Japanese words, so we're not here to learn that today. Um, but people that don't do it now, typically they, there's a lot of opportunity if you've never really put your processes under a microscope and looked at them the way that we would encourage you to. One more volunteer. Thank you. Building a lean system is a never-ending process requiring great courage by its leaders and practitioners. There are no spectators in a lean system. Everyone has responsibility. Any focus on departmental performance is replaced by a focus on process performance. Lean systems are measured and managed on an hour-by-hour -hour basis since one of the key indicators of performance in a lean system is time. As lean is implemented throughout an organization, quality, operating costs, speed of delivery systems, customer and staff satisfaction approach, world-class levels of performance. Thank you to all the volunteers. So how many people have ever tried to drive toward the horizon? What happens? It starts to recede, right? It gets farther and farther away. That's sort of the bad news is this is hard work. I mean, it's usually not somebody's job to just go back to work and fix problems. It's everybody's job, and then it becomes nobody's job. So it does take a little bit of courage to go back and say, hey, we're going to make a change. If you think it's easy, go back and move the fax machine and don't tell anybody. It's a big deal. It's just, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but boy, it just feels different. Um, most changes are rejected out of hand, right? It's just different. I just want the world to stay the same. Is that a good strategy? Not really. It's going to change on you versus for you. Um, so one of the things that I'll just pull out of here, then I'll move on. Um, we don't like to measure departmental performance very much. How many people are doing that right now? How are our departments doing? How much work are you getting done? Um, sometimes we have departments that are overcompensating for the system, and we're causing problems with the best of intentions. So we'll talk about how do you analyze a process. How do you see where that's happening? That's one of the fundamental types of waste is when I'm doing more than the next person can do. I'm doing more than you can keep up with, but I just keep going. Because my departmental goal is to get as much work done as I can. It's not a very good system to do. So we'll talk about that as we go through this presentation. Um, <laughs> so, when we talk about lean systems, a philosophy that demands short lead times for whatever you do. If you make products or services, we'd like to be able to do them in more time, or less time. Why would we want that? Do we know what lead time means? Lead time? I'll give you an example from the real world. Uh, my wife told me a couple years ago, you know, the kids have destroyed this couch. It's a mess. We need a new couch. And she was the boss, so we, we went and got a new couch, and they said, well, the one you want, you know, you don't want an arm on the left, so you can shove it up against the wall. That's a little different. It has to be a certain color green. We'll deliver it to your house in 11 weeks, and we'll take your old one for free. That, that's lead time, 11 weeks. What do you think I said? No, I didn't say anything. I turned around and the door. That's way too long. I don't even know how, but I can build a couch in 11 weeks. <laughs> so if the customer wants it, how long till I get it? It's a very basic thing in any company. I've never seen a company where it doesn't matter. So the longer it takes, the more it costs. The more defects we have, well then we have to be good inspectors. We have to fix them. We have to spend more time doing things. Like your mother probably said, if you don't have time to do it right the first time, when are we going to have time with all these limited resources to do it over again? If we even know that anything's wrong. Um, how do you get to lean? We try to eliminate the waste in the process. And if you don't know how to talk about waste, well, then today's the day we learn. How can we go back and talk to other people about it? Um, it's English, but it's almost like a second language. When you go back, you'll be able to see it. It should start to bother you, actually. The eight types of waste are everywhere. Um, so most importantly, what are we not talking about? We are in the business of going into companies to create jobs, not eliminate them. If you went and did something interesting in your process and you said, hey, you, you, and you, see you later, 
what's the company going to feel like? It feels like a morgue. Instantly. We might change your job around a little bit to get to, to achieving flow. Uh, if we change people's jobs a little bit, then you're going to do a couple weeks in the penalty box, if you know about hockey. If you show them the door, your company does a few years in the penalty box. People notice. They're just trying to get rid of jobs. Then I'm not going to be a part of that. That's not what we're here to do. When we find companies that want to do that, we're by our charter, we have to leave. We're sorry. We're not about doing that. Um, people pick up on it pretty quickly. It's not a good morale booster to get rid of people. And it's also not row harder. Row harder is not a strategy. Everybody just work harder. Make it up on Saturday. We start to overburden people. We start to make errors. Very fundamental. Right? More speed isn't necessarily what you need always. So we jumped a little bit ahead. The, probably the most interesting thing, again, is this, this stuff isn't new. Um, well, the most noteworthy thing about keeping forward products, the, their price is low, is that they're search continuously and relentlessly reducing the lead time, right? From, from, from dirt to car, figured that out by inventing the assembly line quite a long time ago. Um, but that's some of the stuff where we go into companies and they just don't see it yet. It's not new, it's 100 plus years old, but we just don't see it. How do we get closer to flowing our stuff, our information through the system? Even if it's a piece of paper, a form, some information, a database, if nobody's ready for that information, we're creating waiting queues. Right? How many people have an inbox in their computer? <coughs> Is it full? So what are those things doing? They're waiting for somebody to take action. The longer it takes that to happen, it starts to absorb cost. Right? The real estate in your buildings, your people's time, maybe even the horsepower on your computers, it's there, but nobody's doing it. So as we start to shove things into the system and don't spread it out, well then it starts to take longer, right? He figured it out quite a while ago. That's the most expensive way to do anything, right? So how many people are coming from a nonprofit uh, organization? Does that mean poor loss? <laughs> Definitely not, right? I mean, if the goal is to get back to zero, I get that. I work for a nonprofit as well. But typically, we're not looking to lose money. If we can get back to zero with the resources we have, we're probably doing pretty good these days. Um, so even if your goal here is zero, we understand that. Um, how many people can dictate the funding that you get? My caseload is way bigger than theirs, so I should get more. How does that work? <laughs> it doesn't, right? I know a little bit about it, I'm not an expert. But your price or the money that you, how many people send bills for the work that you do? There's a price. Okay, so some people are invoicing and so there's things where we would actually charge somebody. If you're not charging the customer though, does that mean that the providing it is free? Because you're not sending a bill or marking it up. So really the only thing that if, if funding is fixed and we'd like to get back to zero, the only thing we can really control is our costs. Does anybody agree? Yeah. Hopefully. I mean, that's one of the things that, that's universal. That what you do with your time matters. And when you lose time, what happens to it? It's gone. You're never getting it back. I worked at a company a couple weeks ago that made pickles, and they, they kind of said, well, if that machine goes down for an hour, we just turn up the speed and catch back up. Uh -huh. You still lost an hour. If you can do it faster, you probably should be. Tell me about that again. <laughs> right, so it's just sort of, how do we get closer to flow? Um, how do we do, cost is a, just a reflection. Um, cost is how we spend our time. It's after the fact, right? Accounting is always after the fact. It's the behaviors you engage in to throw the party, whatever it is that you do at your agency. Um, so this is typically, if we look at a sideways view, um, it, let's say this is a dollar. That whole thing represents a dollar. Um, and maybe we want to have a little bit of profit so we can go help people or do whatever, maybe buy some computers or whatever we need to do. Um, burden is the, the above, the, it's the, the management, the people who don't do the work typically. Um, typically what we're looking to do is get these people to be more productive. I don't know if you guys buy a lot of materials, but if you do, it, it costs something. So the way we behave in any of these realms, anything that increases this, if this can only be a dollar and my, uh, the, the management structure went up by 5%, what happens? If this got bigger and this can't get any bigger, what, what's going to get squeezed? 
I can't go buy those computers to help people find a job. I can't get the resources that I need because you know what? We, we, our costs are out of control sometimes. Where we spend our time is important. So let's talk about a strict definition. And I will say it is very strict, um, but it doesn't matter what your industry is. I, we use this in hospitals, banks, Michigan Works agencies, whatever. Um, it's a very strict definition because it ha we, when we go through a process and we look at any of the given activities, we like to label them. People really love to argue about this too, but we stick to our guns. We don't care that it's a hospital and you're different. No, you're not. In order for work to be considered value added, it has to meet three criteria, and that's why it's strict. It's not just the first one or the first and the third. It has to be all three. And all we're doing is going through any given process and labeling the steps in the process. The first, and we use CPR to help you remember it. You know, it's a fairly common medical term. Um, but the first, the C means that the customer is willing to pay you for this activity. I like to keep it simple. Are they ever going to see it? How many companies do you think are charging you for stuff that you're never going to see? All of them are. There's a waste in every company. Every company, I'm not here to pick on anybody, but there's companies doing some crazy stuff that the customer's never going to see. So we like to challenge that. Why are you filling out all this paper? Is that like, you have to do that? I understand some of it's mandatory, but all of it, we're going to challenge that. Customers are never going to see that, so do they care? If you did send them a bill for it, what would they say? I filled out this form and made seven copies and distributed them to all the people who needed one. So what? I just want to get a job. Or I want to get a vehicle or something. Um, the P means the physical transformation has to happen. You have to be changing something. I have to be moving some information through the system. I have to be able to, another thing I like to say, just to keep it simple, is the before and after picture different. If the before and after picture is the same, you haven't done much in terms of the customer's perspective. They don't care, right? If I take this, let's say I make cell phones, and in order to do it, I have to put five miles on this thing inside my factory. Does the customer care about that? If I pick it up and put it down 75 times, I'm not changing anything. So we're going to question that. Why are you doing that? And the third thing, and this is, people love to argue about the first two. The last one is pretty universal. You have to get it right the first time. In order to be considered value added, that doesn't mean we're really good inspectors and we discover our mistakes really well and fix them like really fast. That means we, we, A, we are willing to admit that there's something wrong and we do some problem solving, right? So right the first time, most people wouldn't argue about that. Um, so again, to, to be considered a value-added activity, it's got to be all three. What you'll find is most of your stuff does not meet that criteria. If there was more than 5% of the steps, I'd have to see it. I wouldn't believe you. Because we've mapped every industry you can think of. And it's strict. That's a very strict definition, right? So what we're going to find is a lot of things are never going to meet that criteria, so it falls into complete waste. It's non-value-added. But what we have is a third category. And it's the biggest one by far. It's non-value added, but we still have to do it. The legislature says so. The paperwork is required by federal mandate, whatever. Let's not break the law, but let's analyze our process for where is the value added work and where is everything else. Right? So CPR, customer cares, physical change, right the first time. That's our definition and we stick to it. Um, go back tomorrow and think about that. If you did a detailed timesheet for everything that you did tomorrow or whenever you get back, how much of it meets that criteria? The number one goal is to get people employed. Well, how much time are you spending doing that? You mapped out every little thing. Please don't do it. Don't write everything down. That's a waste in itself. But just think about it. How much time, if I threw it into a bucket, value add or anything else, what percent of the day? It's usually very small because it's strict. So we're going to talk about, there's three different types of waste. We're going to talk about the eight types of waste in a lot of detail, so I'm not going to labor it here. Um, one of the things is, is in, in, across the Michigan Works agencies, do you all do it the same way? No. no way. I've been to enough of them to say that there's variation in the process. But we expect a similar outcome, don't we? Yeah. Anytime you have variation in your process, it's the enemy. I don't care what your process is. Um, if you're making airplane parts, do you think you can have defectives? You have to be very precise, right? So when we have variation in our processes, 
we can, we should, in fact, we should expect variable outcomes. If your data wasn't variable and I went and saw that you're doing it different, I question that. It has to be. So every time we have people, how many people have the people executing processes in your building differently when they should be doing it kind of the same? But we expect uniform outcomes. We expect all these great things, but we don't have any standards by which we say that's correct and that's not correct. Um, so we have variation. It'll creep into your process when you don't have a standard. Right? If I watched you do it, could I say that that was done correctly or incorrectly? And then when we say incorrect, we do some coaching. We don't yell. We don't punish in public. Coaching. This is the standard. We're not doing it that way. We care about variation in the lean system. It's the enemy. Um, and the, the, one of the fundamental things I think I said in one of the second, second or third slide, lean is not about making people work harder. That's not a good strategy. When people have to go faster, when you have to do seven people's jobs and work every day, every Sunday, you start to make errors. You start to forget stuff. How many, how many balls can you juggle at one time? So overburdened is very, we like to be analytical. What does the workload look like? When the work goes across your process, where does it, what does it look like? Where does it stop? So variation and strain, we'll talk a little bit about today, but we're going to spend a lot of time defining the eight types of waste because most people have never been through that simple exercise of saying, hey, this isn't working for us. What do we call it? What tools should we pull out of our little, out of our toolbox to do something about it? That's what Lean is about. It's about having tools, but recognizing when to use them is the, is the challenge. Would you ever pull out a saw to drive in a nail? It's not going to work. Right, so part of it, this is today's the Reader's Digest version, but we'll talk about some of the, the tools. How do we diagnose? Doctors need to diagnose before they prescribe. We like that philosophy. We don't just hand out pills. We want to know what's going on. Right? So diagnose before you prescribe. So let's talk about the eight types of waste. We'll give you a lot of detail here. It's the elements of your process that don't do anything for the thing that's going through the process. Whether that's a piece of information, a form, a person, a body, uh, a vehicle, whatever. Whatever it is that you happen to do. Waste on, only adds cost and time. But one of the things I'm going to challenge you on all of these is when you see, A, it's good to know the eight types of waste, but you almost have to step back. And when you see it, that's a symptom. It's not a problem. Most people do problem solving by going right to the problem and saying, I'm gonna, I, here's where I see it, so here's where I'm going to fix it. You kind of have to step back and say, wait a second, my system is perfectly designed to let that happen. If it happened again tomorrow, would we know? That's a scary question for a lot of people. But we're really good at fixing them. That's not what we want to be. So um, again, I'll challenge you. One of the things that's cool about knowing the eight types of waste is your opportunities to get to, 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 to the surface. And some of them are absolutely free. We should just stop doing that. Would anybody notice? Put that time right back in your pocket. How many people have a lot of extra time these days? What if I said, hey, I could save you 10 minutes by organizing the office? 10 minutes a day, what would you say? 10 minutes a day, every day, for 50 weeks is 41.6 hours. How many people would love an extra week to actually do the work? Right? To come up for air and do it correctly? That's sort of what we're talking about. Go back and find yourself 10 minutes of waste after this presentation. If you can't, call me. I'll help you. You've got to be there. So we use an a acronym to help you remember it. It's downtime. Um, how many people use a computer? What happens if you come in and it doesn't work this morning? <laughs> Not much. Right? Downtime. Downtime could be a machine, it could be yourself, it could be your computer, it could be your database, the system that you use, the MIS, whatever. If it's not there, it's not there. So we can all sort of relate to downtime. Um, but we'll go through them one at a time, so I'm not going to read them to you here. Probably the most interesting thing is when you talk about lead time, remember, it takes 11 weeks for me to get my couch. How much of that 11 weeks do you think meets the value add criteria? Mm -hmm. Where you're physically changing something that I'm going to see and I'm willing to pay you for. Ten days. They probably had a whole bunch of departments, and we want each department to do a lot of work today, so we're going to build a hundred of those right now, and then I'm going to send all a hundred to you, and you're going to put the upholstery on, all a hundred, so you get a lot done, and then you get to stuff all the pillows, and then you get to put it together. <laughs> Everybody got a lot of work done that day. But my couch is stuck right between you guys. I'm number 99 in line. That's why. Because they're batching up the work. 
So downtime, when we look at any process under a very strict microscope, we <coughs> said our value added proposition is greater than 10 percent. I frankly don't believe you. I've never seen that before. It's pretty strict. So the D in downtime is a defect. A lot of people think, hey, you know, I went and I bought this cell phone and I, I did what I was supposed to do. I charged it all night exactly like they said. And when I unplugged it, it didn't work. <laughs> it's defective, right? What's the goal for this thing when I push the button? It turns on and I can make a call and whatever I want to do. So that's what most people think. We make stuff and it doesn't work. We have a much broader definition. Our process had an opportunity to satisfy its customer's requirements. And it didn't happen. How many people received a defect last week? An email that didn't have all the information in it. What would the standard be in an email when I'm asking you for something? Did I get a response, right? I don't have to come and look over your cube and say, oh, you're on the phone, I'll come back. It's a defect. We don't even think about it that way. I had an opportunity to provide you the information correctly the first time, and you had to shake me down for two weeks or call me on vacation. So defects, are, we have a really broad definition. Who's the customer? Got a question for you. It's up there, I think. <laughs> the customer is the person who receives your work. Right? I ask you, how many people are sending bills? If you're sending bills, don't forget about that person. They pay you. They're very important. But internally, if I do my work and I hand it to you, you are my customer. Right? So it's up to you to tell me what's wrong with it. Please don't just fix it and keep going. I need to know when something's not right. Right, so how many people, can somebody give me an instance of a defect where you work? Just one example. Um, data that uh, doesn't match one set versus another. Ah, so we're gathering data in two places and they don't match. What's the truth? I throw them both out. What's the truth? Right, okay, so there's probably a standard that says I expect the truth when I divide x by y. Why are we getting different numbers? Defect. Right? Usually on a math test, how many answers are there? One. Right? Where do you get it wrong? Um, other defects, come on. This is easy. Uh, too many people having to sign off on approval for something? Uh, we'll talk about, that's another, that is one of the eight types of waste, but it's, it's a different one. Defect, what would the standard be? That's the question. If you didn't meet that standard. We send a report and it doesn't have complete information. It's incomplete. How many people receive stuff that's not complete and accurate? Mm -hmm. If you took every email you got and threw it into two buckets, what would it look like? What would the pie chart look like? People receive defects all day long and they just don't think about it. That didn't go right the first time. That wasn't value added. It's a whole different way of looking back and saying, wait a second, my process, if you have a lot of defects, that's a problem, right? Yes. Remember my challenge? No, it's a symptom. You have to diagnose the problem before you can't just go grabbing a tool and prescribe something. I have to figure out, how is your system allowing that to happen? If it happened right now, would you know? Is there any kind of error proofing in place? When you go online and you try to buy something with your credit card and you forget your expiration date, what happens? It stops the process and makes you aware of it when? Next week? Right now. So when we have defects, how good is your system? And how, how easy is it for it to escape the situation? It's just one different way to say it. I, I get them every day, but how is that happening? Is it a training issue? How many people have heard, let's put a training piece together for that? No, I'd like it to stop you and not let you save it. No training that I want to actually fix the problem. Contain it. Right? So when we have defects, that what we consider is, you know, from the customer's perspective, it's up for them. If you don't have a standard, how do you know if you're meeting their expectations? So wide open question there, right? No standard. It's going to be a variable output every time. Uh, what's the cost of What's the cost of poor quality back at the ranch? <clears throat> For every dollar that you spend, what percent of it is waste? Do you think? I have to teach you the other types first before you can answer that. But that's a question that you'll never understand completely. You could kill yourself trying to figure it out, but it's better to spend that time trying to drive the waste out. Right? What's the cost of poor quality? Out of everything you had to fix yesterday, stop and write that down and do a whole bunch of Please don't do that. It's just a, it's a large, interesting number that you'll never have your arms all the way around. But it's an interesting number usually. Waste is everywhere. Um, what's the cost of an angry customer? You ever been to a restaurant It was dirty? Did you tell anybody? I do that all the time. 
you get bad customer service, I'm going to tell everybody. And then 10 more. Right? So what's the cost of an angry customer? Um, people start making judgment decisions from your curb. What does your process look like when I enter the system as a customer? So defects are an interesting thing. It's hard to quantify all of them. But how many people know what the number one defect that your company is without a doubt? There's an opportunity right there. Go back and figure it out. What's the thing that you would ever, out of, a, out of 10 attempts, how many do you get correct? What percentage are you looking at? Most people don't have data like that because they don't gather it. Need that data. Um, so the O in downtime is overproduction. And that one, frankly, is the one that gets most confused by people, but it's kind of the easiest one. I'm doing something faster, sooner, in a bigger quantity than you can handle right now, right? I'm gonna make a hundred couch frames and I'm gonna send them to you and you have to put all the stuffing on it, hundred of them. Were you ready for all 100? My department got a lot of work done though, right? So when we start to measure departments and say, get a lot of work done, we don't care about the next person in line, you're overproducing. How many people send work because somebody requested it? How many people requested all the emails in their inbox today? <laughs> That's a whole different way of looking at it. You can send me one more, and then I'll send you a receipt, and you, that gives you the license to send me one more. I don't want 50 emails in my inbox. I want one, right? Don't overproduce it. The next process ain't ready for it yet. What happens? <sighs> wait. Anybody ever, anybody ever have to wait in line before? <laughs> Why? Batch size is too big for what the, if you have if you want to get on a, a roller coaster, there's only so many seats and there's this big batch of people coming at it. Waiting queues will develop. I guarantee you I had to wait in a line before. But it's just a different way. Why is that line occurring? It's a mismatch between supply and capacity. Right? Somebody's overproducing. If you see big piles of stuff or your email's full and you haven't read it yet, somebody you've received the overproduction from somebody else. The difference is that either you request it or I'm sending it anyway. I just want it off my desk. That means you're pushing, right? So overproduction means doing more than the next process can handle. So overproduction, right? That's problematic. It's a problem. Yeah. How many people experience that all the time? Overproduction. Is it a problem? It's a symptom, right? They're all symptoms. Symptomatic. The process allows me to overproduce because there's no signal to tell me to stop. There's no maximum that says, hey, you're overburdening here. We don't have, now we have to manage the inventory and I have to have a meeting with my boss to tell me which one to do next and how many balls can you juggle at one time. If you're overproducing, that's a basic question. How do you get your work? Well, people just send it to me. Okay. And we know there's no signal. There's no signal. If you're not there, what happens? Nothing. I just want to understand, right? So the W in downtime is waiting. Um, if you've ever had to wait in line, that's, there's a reason for that. If there's information in your inbox waiting, there's a reason for that. If you have a stack of forms on your desk, what's the one on the bottom doing for sure? <laughs> it's waiting, right? How many people pull from the bottom with all that paper you have to do? You're not doing first in, first out unless you pull from the bottom. Nobody ever does that. So things start to take forever, right? So waiting is a fundamental type of waste. I guarantee you had to do it as a person before, right? You ever go to the bank and have to wait? Well, you're, you're a work piece, aren't you? You ever go into the emergency room and have to wait? <laughs> Hospitals don't like to talk about it, but when I walk through the door, I become a work piece, right? Now put me through your process. How long should that take? I, uh, I've had to wait for hours at the emergency room. And all they had to do was look in my daughter's ear and say, oh, here you go. So there's like 30 seconds of value-added work, and I've been here for five hours. That's how strict we like to be is about value-added time. Waiting is never value-added. Um, how many people have things waiting in their system right now? How many people have stuff waiting at home that needs to be? The more stuff you have, the longer it's going to take to do. So what are you doing to control the inventory? That's one thing to think about. Um, waiting is, again, symptomatic. Why do we have waiting? Sometimes, I don't know if you guys have a lot of machines, but if we have things that going from process A to B, there's a changeover in between set things up differently, you have to queue up the printer, that's that special form, you have to change the printer over. 
Um, we have unsynchronized schedules. When I was visiting some of the Michigan works, uh, some people start at 8, and some people start at 9, and some people come in whenever they want. And so that's an unsynchronized schedule. If I want work to flow across that, everybody's got to be here. I'm sorry. I'll be the bad guy and say that. You have to be there. Work doesn't happen when you're not there. Um, how many people have processes? That, oh, that, he had to leave, but he said, I have to get seven signatures on stuff. Right? What happens when you need a signature and the person isn't there? Nothing. Right? Nothing. Um, sometimes if there's no signal to do it, nothing happens. We don't do FIFO. We do LIFO. Or FISH is the worst. First in, still here. <laughs> a lot of people are doing that. Right? But it's still there because I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, and when we do things in big batches, right? I, I send you five things, but you can only do one at a time. There's, there's four waiting. There's nothing complex about that. Um, so when you start to see, one thing that's interesting about waiting is you can start to see it. Like as a lean practitioner, we get excited about piles of stuff. How did that pile of stuff get there? How did that pile of stuff get here? Um, I've been in hospitals where they say, ah, we want to give you a tour. We just expanded our waiting room. Isn't it nice? What do you think we say? Cut it in half and do something value added with it. I don't care if it's brand new, you're never getting that money back. It's too big. That means you're, you're counting on there being more waiting in the future. Force that. Make it a real estate issue. Um, so again, what's the paper on the bottom doing? Um, fast in, first out, you're, you're guaranteeing a delay. Right? How many people get emails that are marked urgent? And you read it and go, oh, that one can wait. <laughs> My boss does that all the time. It can wait or it can't. Depends on who's sending it. But um, is that an interruption? Just to make yourself aware of it now. Wasn't that important? When they're all important, are any of them important? Uh, we don't know that person. So waiting is a fundamental thing. Um, an electronic version, how many people have a full inbox and you haven't even seen them yet? I mean, it's waiting, right? But how many people are convinced that when you email something that the next person's working on it immediately? <laughs> they're camped out waiting for it. It's never like that. We just kind of, out of my world means out of my world, right? Hold on, let's look at the system here. Happening. Anytime there's a handoff, things go wrong usually. Anybody disagree? No. I say, if you're ever in a hospital or if you ever get a bank statement, ask questions. We see all kinds of weird stuff. Um, the end and downtime is one of the ones, if you read a, a Toyota book about waste, they don't talk about this one. There's only seven types of waste because they do a good job of treating their people well. Non utilized talent means we don't do a good job of giving the people involved who have to do the work. Good ideas only come from conference rooms, right? How many people are living that right now? <laughs> Death by committee. You guys know what that means? We have a great idea, then nothing happens, right? So non-utilized talent is one of the ones that we feel is probably most problematic in some places. Um, frankly, most people are dying for you to ask, what's the number one defect that you get every day? And if we could get rid of it, you could actually come up for air or take that vacation. Um, they're dying for you to ask. How many people have zero ideas for improvement? Whatever it is that you work, you have nothing. So what is the mechanism by which we actually harvest those ideas? We call it Kaizen, we'll talk about that later. Um, the way our approach actually it mandates that the people who do the work have to be involved. How many people have ever had their work redesigned for them? How did that go? I got an experiment for you. Everybody hold your arms for me. This is a difficult one. Now hold them the other way. That's what it feels like when you redesign someone else's work for them and say, this is the new way. And what if this is the new way? And I'm right, and you're saved. Paying a million bucks. What's wrong with that? Even if I'm right, I have, I'm not going to own that. When you're not looking, it's going to be going like this, right? You <laughs> resent it, right? They reject it out of hand because it's different. You have to sell it to them, right? You have to give them a vision of what's going to be better, right? You kind of common sense stuff that a lot of folks don't do. Good ideas only come from conference rooms. If we have a lot of non-utilized talent in the building, is that a problem? Ah. It's a symptom, right? Why do we have that? Well, maybe our job descriptions aren't very clear. Maybe we have old style management. Management means telling people what to do, right? Not from our definition, but how many people are out there doing that? 
They make a career out of telling people what to do versus coaching. Every team that wins the Super Bowl usually has a decent coach. They go in and say, I observed something that didn't go well. Did you work on this? Please try. Be nice. Um, we don't have good training when the dollars get cut. What are the two things that start with T that we cut? Yeah. Training and travel, usually, right? If I had $100,000 budgeted for training and I don't do it, I get to keep that money. But what happens to our skill sets? Right? So training. Um, we have a, How many people have a suggestion program? If you have an idea, just write it down and we'll get, to, get back to you. How does that work? I've never seen one that's successful because you owe them a response. It might not always be yes, but you owe them a timely response. Otherwise, it's death by committee. They don't ever work. We like to grab a specific problem and go ahead and solve it. Not, what are all the problems in the world? No, 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 and just deny everybody's suggestions. Um, and again, management means telling people what to do, therefore we don't involve people. Um, this is kind of what we see. Again, there's people dying to ask. The people, I'll, I'll do a Bob Marley quote, who feels it knows it. The people who do the work know what's wrong with it. They know all the dirty little secrets. They know all the workarounds. But to be honest with you, they do the workarounds because they have to. They might not even recognize that that was a defect because it happens all the time. And what does all the time mean? How can we measure that? Um, so good ideas are management's responsibility. This is what probably 80% of the people in your organization, I don't know you, I don't know where you live, but most people will take a wait and see approach. Do you agree? Yeah. I'll go second. Do you third? I like to watch NASCAR crashes too. But we need to have people involved in the process, right? The team downtime is transportation. Um, how many people think it's value added if I have to put a mile on this thing to build it? The reality is, is, in most processes, there's going to be some transportation. I have to take it to your desk. Um, how many? Most stuff is probably happening at lightning speed with the email. Um, but if I have to move stuff, one of the things that when I was going to all the Michigan Works agencies, I said, "What is all this paper? <laughs> and how did it get here?" Well, duh! I had to go to the printer and come bring. What you? No, that's a round trip to the printer. Right? So who's paying you for that? Does the customer care about that? I understand. I don't want to get into forms today. They, some of them are required. Um, but how does stuff get from A to B? Usually it's the Shoe Leather Express. Right? I took it there, and it was, it's almost always a round trip. So transportation is one of the things. There's no magic carpet. We understand that. Um, we don't want to chain you to your desk so you can never get up. But there's going to be some We just want to be efficiently wasteful. Right? There's always going to be some. Let's minimize it. If it's, if it's 10 miles, can we make it five somehow? Maybe we need to put the process in a different sequence. Maybe the people shouldn't be located in departments, because that's not how the work is done. Big change, right? So um, we have a lot of transportation. Again, that's a symptom of sometimes it's the layout. Anybody ever grab the drawing of your building and just study it from above, as if you peeled off the roof and say, this is how the work goes? Does it make sense? Does it cross over itself like multiple times? Does it ever come back to me? Why? Maybe it has to, but anytime it has to come back, that means that's our institution wants. So transportation, um, sometimes it's the layout. Sometimes we do, we have so much darn paper, we have to transport it. Okay? That's just the way it is. Um, who knows what a monument is? A monument is something we're convinced we could never change or move, right? This process would be way better if that wall wasn't there. That wall has to be there. Why? You have to challenge me. How about a nice door right there so I don't have to walk down there? Every time I do, there's my 10 minutes a day right there. I'm, tra I'm transporting stuff. Nobody's paying us for that. Right? So transportation is fundamentally wasteful. Um, how many people can relate to that? How did all this stuff get on my desk? Right? How much of this is the customer ever going to see? Very little. Right? They might just have to sign in and give it back to you or something. Um, how many people miles can we put on each of our people back at the ranch? Right? The people who are overburdened already, how much of that are they doing? Transportation waste. A lot. Right? You just stand back and watch and see it. Um, um, the I in downtime, so T is transportation. The I is inventory. And inventory does not mean widgets in the factory always. Usually in your world, it's information that's been put into the system and it's still here. 
We haven't finished it yet. We haven't gotten to the end zone. Um, inventory is information or material in, in excess of what I can do right now. So when you have a full email inbox, you have a lot of inventory, don't you? Right? Those are your work pieces. You'll go through them in whatever sequence you think makes sense. But the more inventory you have, the less likely you have what you need when you need it. Anybody agree with that? I know that purchase order is here somewhere. Just give me 10 minutes. Well, I can search my email. What are you talking about? Well, that's, oh, that's lost time. So where is it? Um, inventory is an evil one because it, it magnifies all the other ones, right? Inventory is the symptom of overproduction. Um, how many things can you do at one time, right? That's how many people get interrupted because the inventory keeps coming. Now, where was I on that one? And then I just start over. So inventory is one of the things that. Um, I'll give you an example. I was working in the hospital, and this nurse, I thought it was scary. She'd go see eight patients in a row and say, hey, I gave you some pills, and I, I didn't give you any. I checked your blood pressure. And, um, you know, you're diabetic, so I checked your sugar. And she remembered all that inventory in her head. And about two hours later, she went to the computer and said, now, what did I do for everybody? I hope I get it right. I hope I gave you that medicine. We kind of said, hold on, take the computer with you. Why would you create that huge batch of inventory and then you have to sit down for an hour and do just that, batching up the information. That, that's scary. How many people can remember what they had for breakfast? <laughs> Let alone, what am I doing with the medicine today? So inventory, lots of inventory is a problem, right? It's a symptom, right? Why do we have a lot of inventory? Well, your process is perfectly, it, it, it's perfectly set up to do that. Stuff just it lingers. Um, sometimes we buy stuff just in case. Again, non-level scheduling. We do a whole bunch of stuff on one day, then a whole bunch of stuff on the next day, and then we, we batch up the work itself. Right? We only work on one type of case on Monday, and then we work on a different type of case on Tuesday. We're starting to create inventory. Um, when we have an unbalanced workload, if we're disorganized. Um, how many people, you guys all work in an office, right? Pretty much. This has been pretty well studied, and not every office is the same. But what percentage of the time do office people spend looking for stuff? <laughs> it's here, just give me a minute. Okay. How long? On average, I hate averages because those high lapse things, but on average, it's about 30%, 31%. So a third of your time is spent looking for stuff. Would you agree? Not everybody's the same. But where's that email? I know Dan sent me that email. Where is it? Oh, it got archived. I, maybe you can get your hands on it, but. The more inventory you have, the less likely you have what you need when you need it. It doesn't mean it isn't here, but how organized are you? How, how, how quick can you get your hands on the one, two, three, four, five? Um, inventory, again, I think I jumped ahead. When we see large piles of stuff, that should bother us, right? Well, how did that big pile of stuff get here? Are we overburdening you? Different way of looking at it. Piles of stuff got there because there's no signal to stop. There's no signal to rebalance the work. It just keeps on going, right? So when we talked about managing things, I think hour by hour is a little bit too frequently for what you guys do, but maybe every day we want to say, how did that process behave yesterday? Normal or abnormal? We just want to know. Maybe we'll just keep on going because everything's cool. How would we know, right? How much inventory is in the system today? Because everybody can only work on one case at a time, usually. Um, and by, uh, M in downtime is motion. Transportation is moving your stuff through a process. That's going back to the printer you know, 50 times a day. Motion is moving yourself through a process. Again, if you have a weird layout and I have to go all over the town to get my work done, well then that's what I have to do. Right? You might be already stuck with the building, but how are we utilizing the resources inside the building? Where is our, if we have to go to the printer, where is it? Is it in the middle where everybody can take it? If we have to be wasteful, let's be about it. Um, so transportation stuff, motion is yourself. Um, lots of motion waste is a problem, right? It's a symptom, right? Why do we have it? Um, it's perfectly laid out to make you get up all the time. We don't want to chain you to your desk, but we, we, we consider motion waste to be non-value added, right? Go ahead and go get some coffee. You're allowed to go to the bathroom still. Right? Don't get us wrong. Everyone gets their break. Um, um, again, a lot of times we have motion waste because I'm looking for stuff or simply disorganized. Um, how many people think that if you look in your computer, the, the tree structure, the, the neighbor, your neighbor back at home, they have the same one? Mm -hmm. They store their information the same way you do. 
Would that be helpful? If they went the lottery and say, see you later, I can find your stuff. I have a fighting chance of getting the job done. So when we talk about motion, it's looking through things, it's digging through files. Um, sometimes we just don't share information, so I have to go and ask for it. You ever have to go to somebody's desk and look over and say, you're on the phone, I'll, I'll come back later. That's motion waste. I had to go ask you, because the, e the email didn't contain the information I need. Root cause is the email was incomplete. The motion waste shows up in trying to solve that, right? Um, um, how often do you have to move into, in order to satisfy a customer's requirement? And how much of it could be eliminated if we got organized and maybe rearranged the house a little bit? Anybody ever clean the garage every now and then? Yeah, sometimes the layout just creeps up on you. If you're not constantly looking at the layout, how many people, when you hire somebody new, where do you put them? Wherever their desk was, right? Is that necessarily the right place? Not always, especially if you've never studied it, right? There's a computer there, there's a drop, the phone works. Let's see. Now, who's your customer? Where are they? Who's the person who receives your work? Are they upstairs? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, finally, the, the E in downtime is extra processing. And what that means is that overproduction is doing more than the next person can handle. Extra processing means you're doing more than you need to do in the first place. Anytime you have to, anybody ever have to redo anything? We hate the word re. If you have to redo something, that means it didn't happen correctly the first time. A, you probably have to, how many people have to inspect stuff because it goes wrong sometimes? I have to do file audits to look, make sure that application's in there. Um, when we do extra processing, typically it's because you have to. Your process, you Defects are allowed to escape, therefore I have to do extra processing to find them and fix them. Anybody doing that? Yeah. yeah. Happens all the time, extra processing. If I had to do it, what would the customer say? Do they even care? If I stopped, would anybody notice? Those are your biggest opportunities. Just go ahead and stop. Maybe somebody would notice and we don't know anything, but we're going to ask. Right? What would happen if nobody at least stopped doing it? Um, we have a lot of extra processing. Again, that's symptomatic. Um, sometimes if I don't know what that customer wants, what do I do? Yeah. Too much, I guess. Maybe I don't do enough. Maybe I have to do it three times because I was guessing. If there's no standard, I'm guessing. There's a likelihood you're not going to get it right. Sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't. It's not a standard. Sometimes they accept it and sometimes they don't. Yikes. What if you had uh, DHS referring somebody to Michigan Works and they don't show up in the computer? That's a defect, right? We have to, it's bad customer service because we have to turn you away. And now I have to do it again, so do they. Right? I have to re-refer you, even though I have the thing in my hand that says I'm supposed to be here today. That's an example. There's several different types of waste going on there. But you have to, the first step in solving any problem is what? Recognizing that there's something wrong, right? 12 step, whatever. And whatever kind of problem, if you don't think it's really a problem, then you're going to keep doing the extra processing. You think you're supposed to, right? Um, how many people have get unnecessary reports? I used to be a controller, like an accountant. I was really good at that. All you really need is a one-page graph, but I've got 30 pages for you. <coughs> Garbage, right? Um, how many people do you think? How many? How would you know if your process is complex? You guys think your processes are complex? Yes. If it's difficult to explain. If it's difficult to explain and you've never mapped it, right? right? That's when extra processing happens. I, don't, I do my job very well, but I don't know what everyone else is doing. So I do it, and then you sort it by last name, and I sort it by first name, and I thought I was doing you a favor. And all these little extra steps that the customer's never going to see. If you tried to charge them, they'd laugh, right? So, um, stop and go tasks when we get interrupted. Well, when we get interrupted, and now I have to start over again. Where was I? Or the computer kicks me out if I don't do something for five minutes. Now I've got to start over. Um, so this is just an example. Hey, I'd like you to design a website for me. If you have to spawn 17 reams of paper to pull that off, I'm not paying you for that. I don't really care, right? If, if I'm never going to see that, you're probably doing something that I'm not going to that doesn't mean there's not, the most important thing is the invoice, right? Send me that piece of paper, it's going to get paid. But everything else is on you. You have to put a home over that forever now? Why? How many, 
when you when you create a piece of paper, how long do you have to retain it for? Do you guys have retention like tools? Seven years. Think about that. That's that's expensive, right? If you ever have to touch it twice. Um, So what is, the, what is the goal of Lean and Six Sigma? So why are we learning this stuff? Who cares? Right? The eight types of waste or something, I don't care what business you're in, it, it matters. Go back and find yourself a defect tomorrow. You won't be disappointed. They're everywhere. Um, but what happens when we have a department that's overcompensating? I'm going to give you a really simple example. I have a piece of work and it takes me an hour, and then it takes her an hour, then it takes him two and a half hours, and then it takes Dan five hours. <clears throat> and you decide to go faster, because you can. Is that helpful? It takes us each an hour, and it takes him two and a half hours, and you're gonna send stuff to him faster, right? With the best of intentions, you screwed the system up. You're making a bigger waiting queue there, right? How many people do stuff because it's within your department's control, right? I have the budget, I'm the director, whatever. I have the best of intentions, I'm in the middle of a process, and I'm gonna get more work done somehow. Without any regard to who was before me or after me, I'm actually making the process worse. Anybody ever been to Chuck E. Cheese? I call it Yucky Cheese, because I hate it. But there's a game called Whack-A-Mole, right? How does that work? A problem comes up, and what are you supposed to do? You solve it, and then what happens? They pop up somewhere else and faster. That's what happens when you don't analyze the whole system. And you stop and say, purchasing needs to get their act together. And you go in and you optimize purchasing or wherever, with no regard for what happens before or after. That's where problems get moved into other departments and you think the problem's solved. Anybody have a problem moved into their department? I don't have to print it anymore. You do. Uh -huh. You haven't solved any problem there. I'm sorry. That's great that you save money on your paper budget, but they have to spend as a system, that doesn't make any sense, right? So system awareness, um, that's a very simple, I, I was amazed, I went online a couple of years ago, you can get a PhD in that, systems theory. But it's real simple, if people have to work and it's, there's dependencies there, it matters how fast you go and it matters how much stuff is in between, right? How many people think that you have folks at, in, in your building that are making errors on purpose? <laughs> they come in every day just to screw you up. Probably not. I've only seen that like twice. I know exactly what I would do, but. Um, so, one of the tools, so any questions on the eight types of waste downtime? I challenge you, you know, you can email me later if you want to, but go back and find one of the eight types of waste, one example of all of them next time you're at work. Just sit down and think about it. What about um, late decision making? Causes waiting. 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 That's interesting because we're about to talk about process mapping. How do you know your process is complex or there's a lot of decisions? You have to map it without trying to fix it. That's the hard part, right? Most people have ideas, ideas. Of, if we just do this, we'd all be saved. If everyone did it my way, we'd be way better off. No, that's scary. Um, when you try to fix, fix a process without understanding the whole thing, that's called whack-a-mole. Right? I had the best of intentions, I had the budget, I had the time, and I screwed the process up. If you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. Um, I've actually been almost thrown out of a client for saying that to him. But I said, I've been here for two days, and nobody can sit me down and tell me how you make money. Do you think that's a problem? I mean, there's hundreds of people here, and nobody knows what's going on. So I think that's pretty bold, but it's true. If you can't explain it to somebody, how did you train them? What does the standard look? Right? So when we don't have that, um, process mapping is the foundation. Um, I'll give you an example of a weird one. Let's say I put a blindfold on you, gently, and I put you in my car, and I drove you to the airport, and I flew you somewhere, and I loaded you on a rowboat, and I rowed out to some island, and I took off the blindfold, and I said, see you at home. <laughs> Why is that a problem? You know where home is, right? If you don't know where home is, it's a huge problem. But you don't know where you're starting from, right? A silly example, but a lot of companies, they go forth and they fix stuff, but they don't really have a map of, well, where were we? What actions are we gonna need to take to get to that future state? If you don't ever have a future state, when are you gonna get there? Never. 
current state will be what you live with for the rest of your life, right? Until somebody comes and changes it for you, that's the scary part. Um, so just a, one of the things we like is swim lane mapping. We like to do relationship mapping. Um, if you have an overly complex process, it will look like that. Okay? There's, there's decision points. There's too many of them. There's reviews, approvals, and inspections. And they, they chew up time. Um, I'll give you an example. I worked in the automotive industry once upon a time. And the owner of the company said, we're not allowed to buy anything, not one nickel, unless I put my signature on every purchase of it, personally. He went to Hawaii for about three weeks, and we almost went out of business, because his process was still supposed to stay that way when he wasn't here for three weeks. No contingency plan, no like, hey, you trust us for less than a thousand bucks or something. It, it took us to our knees, because that was the policy that we had. Um, a lot of people have a process that looks like this, and when you designed it, it made sense, right? Once upon a time, it made sense, but then they invented the internet, and then PDF writers, and then things change, right? So once upon a time, everything makes sense. So how many people have detailed process maps of what you do? A couple, that's cool. That's where you start from, right? If you don't ever draw a future state, well then you're gonna get the exact same results that you get now, right? So, um, so again, I think I jumped a little bit ahead, but systems theory, you can actually go get a PhD in this if you want to. But I think it's pretty simple, straightforward. We analyze the entire system. We don't just look at departments. How many people see behavior like that every day? Ha <laughs> ha. Uh -huh. I'm not going to have a bucket. That's your job. Right? That happens all the time. Especially, what kind of behaviors do you get? I don't care what organism, I'm not just saying. Whatever your organization is, what, what behaviors do you get? Blaming. Naming, blaming, and shaming. Some people make a career out of that. Well, what you really get, and I think this is a Jack Welch quote, what you get is what you reward. If you reward that kind of behavior, it's what? You're gonna get it, right? And if I, if I have tattletales that go and spy on other people, and we say, hey, thanks for telling us that, instead of, why are you looking at their calendar? Why, you know, no coaching, just tattletale. Anybody know a tattletale? <laughs> right? We just don't understand the system. I think that they're doing something wrong. Well, if you knew the whole system, you wouldn't have to you trust that they're doing, how many people trust that people are working as hard as they can? Right, we don't need to blame people. How many people have a mortgage or like a rent payment? Does anybody have to remind you to pay it? No. Does anybody have like a budget that they have to live within? But at work we have to tell everybody what to do. Right, that's not good management. Most people, they, they manage to come to work they want to do a good job, they're not making errors on purpose, but we like to name, blame, and shame people. I'm really good at it, right? That takes a little bit of coaching. Hey, we don't use names. That takes us backwards, not forward. What are you doing there? That's a totally different management style, right? So um, let's talk about reducing batch sizes, and then I think we're probably going to be up against it, right? 3.30? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about this overly simplified process. And one of the things I'll say right out of the gates is I know you guys don't probably make a lot of stuff, but this is our oversimplified process. The customer wants something and it has to go through steps A, B, and C, right? If you just do A and C, I'm gonna know this, right? It has to be done A, B, and C. Um, and this is overly simplified. Every process already takes exactly a minute. It's perfectly balanced. In the real world, it's never like that, but sometimes if we can be close to that, we should. So in order for the process A to get a whole bunch of stuff done today, I'm gonna to batch up the work. Right? I get more work done if I just do all 10 and send them. Right? Why would I do one and then send it, and then do one and then send it? That seems like a lot of sending versus working. Right? So I actually reward process A for getting as, much, as many of these done as they can. And they figured out, hey, if that's what the reward is, that's what I'm gonna do. Right? I get to go home early if I do 10. So I'm gonna do as many as I can. So I do 10, I throw it over the wall to the next process, right? Another huge oversimplification is they were ready for it. They're gonna start right away, right? It's never really like that. There's gonna be a delay almost always. So I do all 10, I throw them over the wall, they do all 10, and they throw them over the wall, and they do all 10. And I'm the customer, when, when do I get my couch? 17 weeks or whatever, something ridiculous. On this process, I, I just want one of these things, and you start right now. How long till I get one? It's up there, right? 21 minutes, right? 10, 
20, and as soon as I do that first one, I'll have one for you. 21 minutes. What if I want ball? 10, 20, 30, right? The last one will fall off at minute 30, provided there's no delays in between. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. They're all good. Um, but the next thing, and this is difficult to do, don't get me wrong, don't, don't think you're going to get there tomorrow, but if you can flow the product, like Henry Ford does, right, a, a car drives away every minute because every job takes about a minute, right, and if there's a job that takes two minutes, we need two people there, we've studied it. So same process, A, B, and C, but instead of making ten, I'm going to make one and send you one. Same question. I want one. How long is it going to take? One, two, three, done. Is that better than 21 minutes? What if I want them all? Right, you can see a lot of this work is now being done. This is called serial processing. I wait for you and you wait for me. This is called parallel processing. It happens at the same time. So I want all of them. How long? Here's 10, 11, 12 minutes. Is that faster than 30? Yeah, so when we start to shove stuff into the system, whether it's caseload or whatever, the more inventory you have, it's called Little's Law, right? Little's Law is a simple equation that says work in process divided by throughput is about how long a process takes. So if I have a thousand cases in the system and we can only work on a hundred a day, what's my lead time? Ten days. So what if I could take about a hundred cases out of the system somehow? And I know that's not easy. But if I can reduce the inventory level, it's proportional to my lead time. It will be faster, right? The smaller, the smaller, the smallest batch size that you can accommodate, because I don't think you're doing heat treating, right? I don't think you're painting stuff. So batch sizes for you, it's something to think about. Are we doing batched up work? A lot of times we reward people for that. Get a whole bunch of work done in your area, and then we'll deal with everybody else who can't keep up. It's not really a strategy, right? So, Questions about about batch size reduction? Try to try to reduce them, and if you can get down to one, that's the ultimate. Um, so what I was going to leave you with is a simple example, and, and this is just a really simple time-based graph. Um, this is an example of a project that I worked on with the state for what used to be called the Jet Program. You guys know the Jet Program? Yeah. Oh, half, I think now changed the name. Um, well, when I met them, we were down here in the, probably the mid to low third or mid thirties. Um, but this is a simple goal, right? We had a caseload reduction that year. If you don't get to thirty-nine point four percent average for the year, you can't run away from your average. If you have a bad month, it counts. Um, this is just an example. How did we get? How did we get to and exceed this? And, and I think the cool news is you're already you're still above fifty percent. Mm -hmm. The goal is really fifty percent. This is just sort of a credit. Um, how did you get there? Was anybody around when they were doing that stuff? Did they identify any defects? Did they look for overproduction? What is all this paper? Waiting, not utilized talent, transportation, inventory, motion, and extra processing. Lots of extra processing, right? We, we, have, we have to fix it because the computer system doesn't do it right. We have to call someone and have them do it. But this is just an example. How do you get somewhere? You set a goal and you measure it, right? This one was simple. The metrics were just, it was complex though. I mean, it's like a, a random stratified sample, and frankly, not everybody understood what that even meant. When they sample it, do you think that when they were doing the case reads, the two ladies in Mason did it the same way? Mm -hmm. uh, they got variable outcomes. I think you met work participation, and you telling me no? I'm asking the same person that they, I'm getting a different answer. That's kind of scary, right? Well, that's defect. By what standard are you doing that? You know, we're going to create some work instructions, right? So a lot of that stuff. Um, before, if you get a case sample and you have to send it to Lansing, is there a checklist that you have to look? Before I send this case, am I sending a defect? Is it incomplete? Is the application in there or is it not? There should be some sort of a checklist. And that's simply because we don't like receiving errors. We don't want to have to call. The, the first thing I saw in that process was, Every Monday we have a two-hour meeting to chase people, right? That person is working, but I can't get the text those. That's all rework. I kind of said, well, how many people are in here for how long every Monday? That's a big opportunity to say, you know, how do we know if the, if the, if the file is incomplete before we send it? We run through a checklist. How did the guy crash the airplane in the Hudson River and nobody died? 
Yes, no? Yes. He busted out a checklist. The co-pilot, that's the only reason they're there. Hey, some things abnormal. Please dump the fuel. Roger, please put the flaps down. A checklist. But do you think that they caught, they taught that crash procedure in, in uh, flight school? They probably did like 35 years ago, right? The, the, the experts just supposed to know, you know, we have a checklist because that's critical. We can't have defects. Um, and that was the, the end of my presentation. We do probably have a couple minutes. Um, any questions, comments? I do believe that whoever introduced me said there's a survey. Um, we, we appreciate any feedback that you can get as well. We, do. we don't just talk about continuous improvement. We can believe in it. Question? Is there um, a lean certification you're talking about? Like, what, how do you? Uh, there are lots of lean certifications, and to me, I don't get too hung up on them. But there's lots of different avenues. If you were interested in doing something with us, we certify people for Green Belt, which is a Six Sigma, a little bit different uh, variation. I wouldn't recommend doing a lot of Six Sigma for the folks that I've worked with in Michigan Works because you don't make stuff. You know, what's a defect? Like when you, you don't measure stuff, right? Are you measuring stuff in millimeters? It's not going to make a lot of sense, but there's various types. We call it Lean Champion. Um, a few folks from the system came and did Lean Office. It's just a three-day commitment where you, yeah, we, we told you, you should map your process, but in those three days, we would teach you how. Right, so this is the 101 Reader's Digest. Um, if you're interested, we do have a booth over there, maybe for another couple hours. Number 16. Hours. Number 16. <laughs> um, it it kind of has a product sheet. What's the commitment on your, on your part? Because usually you're getting paid when you go to class. It's, it's an investment. So what should you expect in return? Um, what type of person should you send? Do you think everybody should be a change agent? No. No way. It takes some guts. It really does. To stand back and say, I don't care. Nobody cares about that. We're not getting paid for that. So why are we doing that? Take some guts, right? That, to me, that's the whole value in consulting, and I don't work here. I'm going to question it, right? So if there's no questions. If you want to ask your questions after we get that, I'll we'll be cleaning up. Um, questions are free, so don't hesitate. And again, thanks for coming. Enjoy the rest of the uh, conference. Thank you.